Okay, are we good? I think so. We're here, guys. It's hey. ru- it's rough out here for a bitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is a, that our version of it's hard out here for a pimp. It's rough yeah, out here for a bitch. It's rough out here for a bitch. So, yeah. Um, anyway, we're here. Yeah. This is it was slow but kind of fast. Uh-huh. So that's kind of nice. I feel like it went pretty pretty quick. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't as horrible. We had to adjust some angles because it was a little that that was really rough for a yeah. bitch. So hopefully it'll be better this time. But today we're gonna be covering something fun and something kind of not fun. Definitely not fun. I think all of it's fun to talk about. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe not fun. Interesting. Exactly. So we're gonna talk about Suzuka, Formula One race, mm-hmm. and grief. Fun. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, um, I had a moment of growth today before we jump in. It was a big moment for me. Um, I will honk my horn at people. And it's just something that sometimes I'm scared to do because I don't want to get shot and die. Other times I get so angry. I'm like, I wish you'd try it. Which I don't. Please don't try that to me. I don't want to die. So I was on the way here and I was driving. And then this cunt pulls out in front of me slow not like a person who pulls out in front of you and then is immediately like i fucked up and then is on the gas yeah you can't no you so see what would have happened so if if they pull out in front of you super slow and you're already you're in the established lane of traffic if they're going too slow and you like hit them because they don't get up to speed fast enough that's an incident in which like a rear end wouldn't be your fault it would be their fault because they have to yield to oncoming traffic. Yeah. And so if they pull out too slow, they then were not paying attention to oncoming traffic and they hadn't had enough time to establish themselves in the lane no, yet. So literally, if you hit somebody and they're pulling out too slow in front of you, if you hit him, it's not your fault. It was the it's worst. It was so slow. Like, And the thing is, it wasn't like they pulled out in front of me slow and then at, at least increased their speed. They were just slow the whole time to the light. And it was like a regular road. So like just one lane going right, one lane going left or whatever. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I felt the itch to just go, meh, meh, meh. I didn't, obviously, which normally I would have. So I thought that was a moment of growth for me. (gasps) That reminds me of, okay, so I went to Jacksonville for like two days um, Mm -hmm. with my mom and my sister, went to the beach, did some shopping or whatever. So I drove on the way home Mm -hmm. uh, and- there were multiple times on the way that I was a very defensive driver, but I laid on my horn because like the, there was some traffic getting out of Jacksonville because mm-hmm. we were leaving right around rush hour. Yeah. And um, there was specifically where it was like a lot of people were trying to merge into one or two lanes, mm-hmm. but there were two other lanes that were going like 70 miles an hour and we're basically stopped in our two lanes. Um and so there were people trying to merge in and out and stuff like that. And I, being a defensive and also a gracious driver, was letting a couple of people in and out and whatever because I'm like, we're not going anywhere. It, I, you know, I flash my lights at them, leave a gap. I'm, I'm nice. But I did that for one person. This one car goes to – I flash my lights at them and they go to get over. But there's another car in the other lane that is also at the same time trying to get over. And they're like – I think maybe in each other's blind spots or don't notice that the other person's moving, they're going to hit each other. So I'm like on my horn, I'm not involved in this, but they're in front of me. So if they crash, it's it going to be, it could affect your life. It would be very inconvenient for me. Cause then you, you're like an eyewitness. You got to stick around, talk to the police. I'm like, no. So I literally start on my horn aggressive, like beep, 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 beep. Like I'm not just laying on it. I'm like, no, pay attention right now. Stop what you're doing. And then I, help them avert Aww. the crash I wow them. that's sweet i'm a good person that's so sweet and wow. i literally looked at my mom because she gets stressed out when anyone's yeah, yeah, yeah. driving that's not uh-huh. her i looked doesn't, at her doesn't she low-key get stressed out when she's driving yes she stresses <laughs> me out when she's driving um <laughs> but uh i looked at her and i said i'm a hero oh god i want you to know that i'm a hero i bet she loved that <laughs> she was like gripping onto she her she was like Jesus help her handle yeah. that was literal Jesus take the wheel huh mm-hmm. I I think I said to her I'm Jesus <laughs> I'm like Jesus I just saved them you're like Jesus <laughs> yeah I'm pretty sure I said that that's nice yeah I was not like G- I mean I was like Jesus and I didn't honk at the lady that was growth for me it's kind of not it's kind of a pretty um small like 
it's thing. baby steps. But we'll yeah, take it. You know, even like just a little like baby like lean. Yeah. I don't even know if it's a step, but it's a lean was, in the right it direction. It was like a shuffle, like a slide. I don't know that I technically have moved, I but I've got like the direction, like I'm about to take a maybe, yeah. maybe like a slide. So Your foot uh, kind of like. Yeah thought it was gonna pick up but yeah didn't fully no it just kind of i'm gonna call it a baby lean a baby lean yeah okay so yeah okay all right let's talk about hitler that'll make sense later i'm immaculately conceived i don't uh, know what to do i swear i'm not stupid take it or leave it sometimes you just want to leave it if i gotta borrow my mom's underwear i'm borrowing her underwear <laughs> you just yeah Misa likes the Jar Jar Binks. I'm not gonna edit it out. <laughs> oh no. I don't know, like I think I'm just pretty great. Just Sucks sing on the planet. Suck. Why are you saying it with a question mark? Clap, bitch. Alright. Three, two, one. Action. And we're live. <laughs> I'm Anna. And I'm Jessica. And this is Why Are You Yelling? I was yelling a lot last night. Uh-huh. Because as we talked about, it'll technically be two episodes ago now uh-huh. because we put them out out of we, sync. We flipped some things yeah. around. So I've been playing Fantasy F1. Mm-hmm. And Daniel Ricardo is on, I think, almost all my teams. What the fuck? Uh, here's some context. I'm watching. I'd like, th- here's another thing. They're in Japan. This is Suzuka. And... It, the race took place at 1 a.m. our time. I stayed up for it. I watched all the pra- practice sessions. I watched the qualifying. I watched it all. And I kept seeing Ricardo get fucked over the whole time. The whole the weekend. The whole weekend, this man gets fucked. And then lap one, nothing fucking changes. Continues to get fucked in the wall. And I... In the wall. Yes, he got into a crash with Alex Albon. Why? Why him again? What's wrong with William? Stop crashing your cars. They can't help it. Stop. And have the decency to keep doing it by yourself if you're going to. Why you got to take out other people? Why you got to bring other teams into your mess? You were doing just fine crashing on your own. All love. (laughs) <laughs> but like all love <laughs> why did you fuck over my guy all right especially your guy who's on your team <laughs> your fantasy team yes on my fantasy yuki was also on all my team so that was nice but that's not the point <laughs> yuki great good job good for you yuki but that's good for not you what we're here that's about not today. that's not it all right um so literally the first lap like the first her second turn technically it's like it goes like this mm-hmm. in the wall i feel like that in the wall and that's not even apparently oh i can't so basically what happened was by the way is that so daniel was kind of in the middle and then you had um i think it was stroll on his left mm-hmm. and so basically he like daniel had no clue that alan was right like behind him on mm-hmm. his right side in his body spot. In his body. He couldn't, didn't see him. Also, where were you going? Where were you going? Alex. Where? Yeah, Alex, where were you going? All love, where were you going? So, where? <laughs> where did you think you were going to go? So, anyway, um, basically, because Daniel was like, oh, shit, I need to give Stroll some room. He did, and he ran and He basically, they clipped his tire. He clipped Alex's tire, and then they just both went into the wall. And no driver has been, they've just chalked it up to like, oh, it's a racing incident. It is what it is. Things happen. Both, yeah, because both of them had the exact same account of what happened. Mm. So they didn't penalize anybody. Now they said that um, if Stroll wouldn't have been in the equation, it would have been a different scenario. Interestingly enough, online, I've seen a lot of people like basically blame Ricardo and they're like, he cut him off. He did this and he did that. I'm like, he took the racing line. Mm. That was the racing line. Where was Albon going? Where did he think he was going to go? Wait, are you trying to win the race on the first lap? What do you mean? Like, what are you talking about? I understand that you're, you're trying to get as, like, because everybody's bunched up there. You're trying to get as mm-hmm. ahead as you possibly can, right? But I'm like, bro, come the fuck on. Like, so now he's also, he's, Albon's wrecked his car and Logan's car. And Logan wrecked 
his, wrecked his car in practice one. Did you know that? I think I saw that. Yeah. I knew I know I had seen uh I think before the race where they said that Alex was gonna keep Logan's car mm-hmm. that they had modified from the Australian yep. uh race and that Logan was gonna get Alex's car with the repaired yep. chassis. Yep, that's what happened. And then and and basically Logan when he was asked about it was like it was gonna be too much work on the mechanics to try and get everything switched back over from how Alex had Logan's car set up from the last race. He's like, that's just on top of repairing the Alex's original car. He's like, basically it's unfair to the mechanics. They don't have enough time to do it. And so this is what it is. And I'm like, poor Logan. He, he's not great. Like he hasn't been great the last, you know, la- last season of the season, but so, I mean, bro, he literally, he just keeps getting the short end of the stick. He, so he crashed his car in practice one. They couldn't get it ready in time for practice two. And then they he was in practice three or whatever. Um, and even though they could repair the chassis in time, he had to revert to the old spec. So they had gotten upgrades for this race. Well, they didn't though those were those were done when he crashed his car in practice one. And so he had to go back to the old version of the car. So now he's having to perform in uh Alex's repair chassis or whatever. With and the old specs. With the old specs. Golly. And so now the problem now, too, is so Alex has crashed his car. And also, Logan was lucky that he avoided damage again because he spun off the track and the latter half of the race, like the kind of towards the tail end. So he was lucky there that he didn't fucking, like, get any more damage to the car that they already had to repair this weekend. Mm-hmm. Williams is struggling. It's a, it's, I, I, that has to be rough. So now the problem, too... They have to try to get all this stuff fixed before China and they have their budget and they've are they're already dealing with how many crashed cars at this point? This is now three, three crashes. So minimum, like they have a week to do all the repairs because they said, as I was reading, they said that the cars will probably have to be freighted out by Monday or next Monday for China, which is where the next race yeah, is. Yeah. So at. they have until basically then to, to work on yeah. It. So it's been. A fucking thing. And so... You would think... Okay, so I understand that this is not an easy thing to do, driving these cars. But you would think by the time you get to the level of Formula One, you are you could at the minimum keep your car out of the barriers and off, out of the wall. Like, I know stuff happens Especially occasionally. Especially when you're by yourself. Especially if it's not a racing incident and someone, you know, forces you off track or clips you or whatever. Like, I understand some outside things happen, but when it's literally just you running into a wall because you don't know how to drive your car or you lose control of it in some way, I'm like, what are we doing? What are we doing? I sometimes race a sim. And by race, I mean, I'm by myself on a track. I think I know a little bit. (laughs) No, literally, that's embarrassing. Absolutely not. I just... Yeah, it's you wild. Would, you would, and again, things happen. Max has crashed. Lewis has crashed. Things happen. But when it happens so frequently to the same yeah, I, driver. I think, yeah, I think that it's just wild because it's like, Williams, what is happening here? Like, what is going on? Can your driver stay on the track, please? So that was like the big thing. I mean, Max won the race. Um, Sergio, second. Carlos, third. I was really, really, really pulling for Charles and you know our sad boy <laughs> it, that's yeah our, our sad boy but you know he got fourth so he just i, I really mean, I want him to do better than he has been doing and i don't know that it, it it's his I, fault i don't know either i mean because you can see the all these teams have different strategies so mm-hmm. and another thing that was kind of a highlight to me because like the race after the end because so the race had to start 30 minutes because they had the red flag and so everybody had they had to do a restart and everything um was pretty boring um there wasn't too it wasn't like a lot of it had to do with strategy there wasn't and so, oh now there somebody who did keep taking over was yuki yuki did some takeovers in a spot of the track that isn't typically done mm-hmm. so it was cool for him i mean it was exciting for him um but like something else that i thought was interesting was so like mercedes initially looked kind of good this race mid i mean they finished you know they in were the in the top 10, 10 but mm-hmm. it was just kind of mid and so lewis said that after the race he that he had quite a lot of understeer which is why because at one point in the race over the radio you hear him say like hey should i just let george pass me and, and so they do and 
um, I think he had chalked it up to do the, I guess on restart, he's, I think he said that he had an incident with Charles, like I, I, but it wasn't like something huge, but I think on the restart, they may have bumped, they might've done something to each they other. Tapped or something. Tapped it and it caused, he, he was thinking that's what caused him to have so much understeer. And you could just kind of tell on the radio when Lewis was like sometimes talking to his team. I it, They feel pretty done with each other. Yeah. He's kind of just over it. Well, I mean, even the team feels over it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know that you are allowed to be over it. But, you know, whatever. So after the race, he was asked if the car had been what he had hoped for. And Hamilton responded, the car is never what I hoped it would be. It's never what we hoped it would be. I got some damage, I think, in the first stint at the restart with Charles, and I had massive understeer, like huge, huge understeer. So that's why I decided to let George buy, because he seemed quicker, and I just couldn't turn the car. And so then in terms of whether he can take any positives from the weekend at Suzuka, he said, I don't know if you can take many positives from the weekend. The car finished, which is good, but we're like, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth fastest. So, yeah. And so Lewis is pretty over it. He, you can just tell he's very over it. He's, he's like, if we're not fighting for podiums, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah, I mean, and it's frustrating. The The discourse online about around Lewis Hamilton, me and you were talking about this the other day, infuriates me, sends me into a rage because it's just, it's fine to not like somebody. Like, you don't have to be a fan of somebody. That's whatever. But it feels different with him. It fe- and the same with Max. Like, people either like Max or they fucking hate him, which I'm like, why? Like, who has time for that? I might not like somebody, I, meaning, like, I'm just not, like, a fan. I don't really root for them or I don't care. But I'm not, I'm never, I'm not like, going out of my way to, like, comment about how much I dislike somebody. No, or just, it's Or just, even paying attention to what they're doing, really. Like, no, it, exactly. I'm, it's so bizarre, but I'm, like... Like, to hate, to hate watch kind of thing weird. is odd. Like, it's giving when people would watch YouTubers they hated just to comment. I'm like, then why are you watching them? Like, why are you in the, com- why are you in the community? You're ruining our time together. Yeah, pretty much. Like, you're ruin- you're you're making this environment toxic and I don't like it. But I don't know. I think everyone's going to have a great wake up call next year. When I'm excited for next year. Yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm ready for the, him to be like, y'all bitches weren't ready for this. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm ready for. Because I adore Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much it. We were. Uh, ta- I will not be grieving him leaving Mercedes. <laughs> so you and I were talking about Lewis Hamilton yesterday a little bit, and I've always Sir Lewis. Sir Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton. He's a sir. He's a knight. Uh, and I've always, since I started getting into Formula One, I've always been kind of like neutral on Lewis because I like an underdog. I like. I don't necessarily go into it loving the number one team because it's not fun to root for somebody who always wins all the time. Like, I want them to lose a little bit because it makes the winning more fun. So I was kind of like, meh, Lewis, he's won all these championships. Like, I don't know if he's my fave. But the more we were talking about Lewis and like even just the off the more the off the track stuff, the more I convinced myself. I'm like, you know what? I like Lewis. I I, I was like, no, but I was like, no, but Lewis. Sir Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. I love Lewis. Like, and yes, a lot of that comes because that's Travis's do. But even like outside of him, like getting into it more, I'm like, why, what do you, what could you possibly dislike about him though? Yeah, Because he's a winner, right? Yeah. He's competitive, but also he's nice, like off the track and stuff. Like, oh, because when you're on the track and you're actually in a race, all those racers have that super competitive, like I can be an asshole if I need to be because yeah. that's what it takes to win. Yeah. But then, like, you don't have to continue that off the track stuff. Exactly, yeah. And Lewis is not like that at all from what you can gather. Yeah. You know, and what you see online is, like, he's nice. He's generally well-liked and well-respected amongst pretty much everyone that knows him and has worked with him and who races against him. Yeah. I don't know that any of the drivers dislike him. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think they, I mean, I think there's been incidents before where, like, Maybe a wreck happened or this, that, and the third. But it's not like a grudge like, sort no, of. No, like I think there was an incident once where Max and him, I think there was a guy where the, it was disputed who caused this one other driver mm-hmm. to wreck, whether it was Max or Lewis. And then I think Lewis won the race and celebrated. And I think there was some controversy with that a long time ago. And I know because I've seen people bring that up. They're like, he's a piece of shit. Cause look how hard he celebrated. I'm like, all right, whatever. But like he's, he does so much in terms of like, he's really into away from like 
Formula One stuff. He's really into art and yeah. music. He's like, he just seems really cultured and well rounded. Super fashionable. Yeah, he's his, fine. his outfits are always on point. I love like seeing what they're what he's gonna wear yeah. to the race weekends. I'm yes. like, okay, what's he yeah, cooking? Yeah, I like seeing I like seeing what he's wearing. I'm and, like, what you got on? And then he's also really into like pushing the sport forward in terms of like diversity and inclusion and like not in like a meaningless way. Yeah. You know, not in just like a, like a virtue signaling sort of way. Exactly. He actually yeah. cares about it. And he puts his mo- like the, his money where his mouth is, so to speak, where he like wants more women involved either in race cars or as part of teams, as mechanics, as team principals, strategists, stuff like yeah. that. Like he um, shows up and supports the F1 Academy like is one of the only drivers who consistently is supportive of that and shows up for those things as opposed to just doing it when it's arranged as part of one of their media days. Yeah. Um, so like he actually does stuff like that. And then I don't, it, it, he just seems like a good person. Yeah, it's just like, I don't know how you look at him and you go, meh, don't like him. Yeah. Them. I just, unless, unless you're just a hater. Yeah. I'm just like, you cannot be a super fan. Yeah. Like, that's fine. But to be an actual, like, hater, that's I'm like, something's wrong with you. Yeah, I'm like, so that's weird. <laughs> that's a red flag <laughs> on you. Yeah, red flag. Red flag. But no, I, um, I'm very excited for next year. I'm going to be Ferrari'd out. We got sad boy and Lewis. Let's go. <laughs> that's what our nickname for Charles. Um, <laughs> which it comes from a very, very um, affectionate place. Yeah. He just has that, like... Sad boy look. Uh, yeah, his eyes always look a little bit sad. Yeah. And he could have been like in a boy band, not a boy band, more like a punk rock style band, like in the 2000s with those sad eyes, and it would have been over with. Mm-hmm. Everybody would have had posters of him on their walls, and they would have been like, I can make him happy. That's like, he he just gives that energy. Yeah, there's that uh, Cindy Lauper song, uh, True Colors, where it's, um, you with the sad eyes, don't be discouraged. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm Charles. like, that's, that's me to Charles. I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey, dude, don't be discouraged. But, we'll get there. Yeah, sad boy, but I'm like, like, it's affectionate. It's not mean. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that he- was that weekend. And so I was grieving. Oh, yeah. Not uh, as hard as Taylor right now, I guess, or how sure her playlists were. So Taylor Swift, uh, when she, she, hopefully I'll know by now, she's got a new album coming out in 10, 11, 12, 12 days. Something like that. From the day of this recording. Yeah. Um, so soon, soon, um, April 19th. And she, when she originally announced that album, she was putting out some like promotional like artwork and stuff. And so on the promotional artwork, it had these like, just like lines, almost like sentences kind of that were kind of artistic that we knew it was going to mean something, but we didn't quite know what it was going to mean yet. Yeah. Turns out she put out five images um, and it turns out those were actually the titles of playlists that she made for Apple Music. Where she took her like uh, her past discog- discography and she sorted those songs into five different playlists and then uh, ter- and then she recorded a little voice memo and put that out, kind of introducing each playlist and kind of what it means to her. And um, so we are gonna talk about that and kind of how people, some people had already kind of uh, deduced or figured out or Mm -hmm. pontificated that this is where it was going to go. Yeah, I have seen a lot of people um, speculate that it was the five stages of grief kind of a thing, Mm -hmm. which to me, I am, I was immediately kind of interested in just because like grief to me is like, it's one, it's an interesting conversation to me. And I, I guess because I've, I've grieved things in my life some things not something like death and like other things. So I'm immediately always drawn to that the kind of conversation. So the playlist, and we'll talk about this real quick. We'll just go through what the playlists are. So, um, in the five stages of grief. So one of the playlists is called, I love you. It's ruining my life. And, uh, the voice memo that Taylor uses to introduce it She says, uh, this is a list of songs about getting so caught up in the idea of something that you have a hard time seeing the red flags, possibly resulting in moments of denial and maybe a little bit of delusion. Results may vary. Um, And so this is the first stage of grief, a representative of it, which is denial. Uh, And one of the songs that was put in that playlist was Lover. Mm Mm-hmm. And so Lover, when it when she first put out that album and that the title track for that, 
she has said before that that she wanted to write a song that was sort of a timeless love song that people could play at weddings and dance to, right? That could be like a first dance sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of singer songwriters kind of have that almost as like a goal. Like that's, yeah. that's kind of how, you know, when your song is a timeless sort of thing. Yeah. And, um, so that she said that that was kind of what she wanted to do with that song. And it is a song about like wanting to spend your life with somebody and like just being so in love with them and stuff. And so the fact that this song is now on a, she's put it on a playlist to say that now it's about the idea of it's about like getting caught up in the idea of something like basically seeing it's like when they say love is blind, like you're blinded to the red flags and the things that maybe like it's not actually what you're you're more in love with the idea of it versus mm -hmm. what it actually is. Exactly. Some people kind of, I think, took a they took it hard or not quite offense to it, but they were kind of like so some people basically saying uh, so you're saying that when you first wrote the song and put it out, you were lying or you were, no, of course not. or you were, um, like what basically love is a lie. Like this, this doesn't oh, mean it doesn't God. basically they were like, it doesn't mean the same now as what we thought it did. And so that means the original meaning of the song isn't valid anymore. Kind oh, of thing. I disagree with that. Yeah. And we've talked before on the podcast about how yeah. art changes over time. Yeah. In terms of like, yeah, you can be in a certain headspace when you write a song and put it out and are creating it. But your relation to the song that you created can change over time, not just like your feelings about the song or it could be like what you interpret the song to mean. Yeah. I mean, I think that it. Or I, even the person it's I about. I 100% could see why that song would be in that stage because like I could see like if you were in a relationship with somebody that you felt like you you get those feelings where you're like you you know in your chest and you know in your heart and you know just deep down that like something might not be okay but there's all these other things that are okay and you're just going to go with that instead or trying so hard to convince yourself that something is you're okay with something. I mean, think of the whole idea, ladies and gentlemen, will you please stand like with every um, guitar, guitar string scar on my hand? Like I take this magnet, my, what is it? Magnetic force. Magnetic force of a man to be my lover rather than my husband. Mm -hmm. She's, uh, she's kept mentioning throughout her music about marriage. And then, and you're losing me. I wouldn't want to marry me either. A pathological people pleaser. Obviously there was something I'm saying, obviously just from based off the music, there was the story, some, there's a there's story, a story being, told. being told about marriage that I feel like lover is her convincing herself she doesn't want marriage because it has every single aspect of a marriage song, but it's her lover, not her husband. Mm -hmm. I think it's obvious what it is. And I think, but there's nothing wrong with that. And I think if you don't want to be married, then the song's beautiful. I think the song's beautiful no matter what, but I think it's kind of always been a little bit obvious that like she was either trying to tell us for a long time, I don't need to be married. I don't need this and I don't need that. And we're finding out now that maybe those were things she was trying to convince herself of mm -hmm. rather than those were her own thoughts or opinions or whatever. And maybe, and maybe it's both. Yeah, I, but, I think the meaning can change, like we said, over time. Yeah. So, and things can have multiple meanings and Taylor has said before that she wants her art, it is open to interpretation. Yeah. So it doesn't have to mean the same thing to everybody no. all the time. Exactly. And she's okay with that. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what art is. It's subjective. Yeah. Um. And so, I mean, I, I uh, saw an interview that she gave when she was talking about Lover. And she said that she had always kind of in her, like the back of her pocket, she had always had that particular word that she was fascinated with and wanted to use in a song. Mm -hmm. And so then when she came up with this song, she was like, it just kind of, it was uh, just the kids met. It was supposed to be that way. Yeah. Um, but I think you can, like you said, you can look at it as this beautiful love song about being with someone forever and wanting to, and being so in love. But you can also interpret a deeper meaning, like you said, about how like you're calling someone your lover but that's intentional. That's a very specific word. It's not husband. It's not partner. It's 
Well, especially when she leans more into the, will you please stand? Like mm-hmm. you stand at a wedding. Yeah. You know, I it's mean, going this... into like the wedding vows yeah, type stuff. Exactly. And, and again, she made it to be played as like a wedding first dance sort of song. Yeah. And, and it that's... can still be both. I mm. mean, I just, I, I think people need to, that's, that's kind of the, something Taylor unfortunately struggles with and probably always will is people taking her music so literally mm-hmm. and not just enjoying what you can take from the music mm-hmm. and how you view the song and i'm like you know it's and granted i mean the other argument would be i mean she decided to make these playlists so it leads you into having that conversation of mm-hmm. like well wait why would she say that i mean so in that particular regard i mean i guess like in a way like you kind of would expect that conversation, but it it doesn't have to be so like, oh my God, you lied. Like, it's not that deep. Yeah, I think it can be, I honestly, I think it just makes it more interesting and more complex. Yeah. When you can take a piece of, uh, when you can take a song, which is a piece of art, and you say, this is the original meaning, and you're so like earnest and sincere when you say at the time of creating it and putting it out, this is the meaning of this song and yeah. what it means to me and how I created it. And then, you know, upon reflection years later, after you've lived more life, then the meaning of it can change and it can still be exactly sincere and earnest mm-hmm. just in a different sort of way yeah and i think you can also with enough time you can be more honest about your fears maybe when you were even writing the song about the things you didn't want to talk about about like yeah this was beautiful but i was also making up for this other part mm-hmm. you know like, because emotions are complex and yeah relationships are complex yeah they're, they're multifaceted exactly so i mean that's just silly yeah but, What was the uh, next one? So the next playlist is You Don't Get to Tell Me About Sad. Which is interesting mostly because do you remember that video that somebody released like, I don't know, maybe four to five months ago where they're sitting in the restaurant and you think people thought they could overhear Joe saying to her, you don't get to tell me about sad. Do you remember that? We were talking about it in the car on the way somewhere once. Maybe. where Vaguely. Where it was like... Somebody like had this footage for so long and never released it. And it's like, everyone's like, oh my gosh, he's telling her that. And we were kind of saying, well, you have no clue the context of that conversation. You don't know if he was telling her that or he was relaying a story he mm-hmm. heard. Like we were trying to like, that's just yeah. silly. So this was interesting to me that mm-hmm. this was the words that were chosen because that was something that was released like that. Yeah. So she, so you don't get to tell me about sad, the voice memo uh, in the voice memo introducing it. She says, these songs all have one thing in common. I wrote them while feeling anger. So if mm-hmm. that did happen in the context of that conversation, he's if he's actually telling her at, in that restaurant it, it, that moment, it was it's telling. Like, it was telling. I feel like she was boy. trying. She was trying to give some context. give some context to yeah. that. So uh, that was interesting. Which yeah. So she said, uh, over the years, I've learned that anger can manifest itself in a lot of ways. In a lot of different ways, but the healthiest way that it manifests itself in my life is when I can write a song about it, and then oftentimes it helps me get past it. Uh, so that would be anger. Yeah. Uh, so that's the second stage of grief. Uh, and then we have Am I Allowed to Cry, which Taylor introduces by saying, uh, this playlist takes you through the songs that I've written when I was in the bargaining stage, times when you're trying to make deals with yourself or someone that you care about. You're trying to make things better. You're oftentimes feeling really desperate because oftentimes we have a sort of gut intuition that tells us things are not going to go the way that we hope, which makes us more desperate, which makes us bargain more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that would be the third stage of grief, uh, which is bargaining. The fourth one is old habits die screaming. And she says uh, to introduce playlist, we're going to be exploring the feelings of depression that often lace their way through my songs. In times like these, I'll write a song because I feel lonely or hopeless and write a song and writing a song feels like the only way to process that intensity of an emotion. While these things are really hard to go through, I often feel like when I'm listening to songs or writing songs that deal with this intensity of loss and hopelessness, usually that's in the phase where I'm close to getting past that feeling. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I guess, processing. Um, And so that would be the fourth stage of grief, which is depression. And then the final playlist is called I Can Do It With a Broken Heart. Uh... And she says uh, that this is where we finally find acceptance and can start moving forward from loss or heartbreak. These songs represent making room for more good in your life, making that choice because a lot of the time when we lose things, we gain things too, which would be acceptance. Yeah. And so grief to me is something I've always found interesting and the five stages I've always found very interesting. And that's because like, 
I think, and this has nothing to do with Taylor. It just, cause she kind of sparked the conversation of grief. And so I had told Anna that I wanted to talk about it because like, I've had a lot of things on my mind recently about like things I've lost in my life that it's, it's so hard and there's different things to grieve, right? Grieving a relationship, grieving a friendship, grieving, lose, leaving your job, you know, and being scared and starting a new one. Like any major change in your life is like some sort of death in your life, whether it's true death, you know, by death or just an ending to something. And so for me, I've experienced the unfortunate death, like true death, like people dying. And I think grief is so interesting to me because like the five stages, I think sometimes I would say for people that haven't experienced it to that intensity might think like, oh, you go from this stage to this stage to this stage to this stage. Like and you move very cleanly yes. from one to the next in order. And I would, I personally would disagree with that mm. as, um, so the first instance that I can recall grieving was when my uncle died when I was uh, eight. It was my mom's younger brother. He was 32 and it was very cliche in the sense of like, he was like the happy one and the one everybody loved and he was the fun uncle. And I mean, it was literally like that kind of shit, right? Completely tore my family apart. Um, this is very real. This is very like not fun, but it, this is just honesty. And family's never been the same since. Um, pretty much someone said to me once that I thought was interesting because my family is already very complicated him dying was the final nail in the coffin of us being extremely dysfunctional and unhealthy. And it was. Um, so from a very young age, I've had a very, very like close relationship with grief. And um, which that's an interesting thing in and of itself, that grief is not just a feeling. It's yeah. a it's an actual like presence almost yeah. in your, like it's a, almost like a thing yeah. in your life that you then have, that you can have a relationship that, with. And that's where I feel like sometimes grief feels like a relationship or sometimes like a friendship. Cause it's the only one that understands you mm -hmm. when like you've lost something and nobody else understands exactly what you're feeling or you feel that way. Right. Um, you feel very protective of it, but with grief, you know, it's not just like, oh, I woke up and I'm angry or I'm sad or I'm this or I'm that. Sometimes you're in bargaining and then you go to acceptance and sometimes you're fine. You're accepting it till you're suddenly not anymore. And it's you just kind of fluctuate and move. Yeah. I think that that's something that doesn't often get talked about enough that with grief, you can experience one, you can experience multiple parts of grief simultaneously. Yes. So you can be in the anger and depression stage at the same time. And you can bargain. And bargaining. All, this, like, all of them. They can coexist, but you can also move from one to the other very quickly and not even in order. Like you kind exactly. of just th throughout the day, like yeah. you can be, or you can go through days or weeks where you're in one or another. Yeah. Like, I mean, there. I mean, and it's just one of those things that's like, it's not a perfect circle. It's not a linear process that you can just go through and then get to the other side. And it's like, I'm not trying to be like depressing for people mm -hmm. that haven't experienced this, but unfortunately death is something, if, if there's one thing we all have in common, it's that we're all going to die and, and we're all going to experience the loss of a loved one, unless you're the one that dies. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, but so those two things just go hand in hand together where everybody at some point is going to experience it, but it's just, it's frustrating when some people haven't experienced the magnitude of like the grief that you've experienced, because like, I think with grief, that's, you know, people say like, I think too, sometimes people are like, you know, how long are you going to let yourself feel this way or how long are you going to do a b c you know this isn't healthy this isn't that basically but I think letting it affect letting you. it affect you and yeah. i'm like or i think some people that experience grief that have lost somebody and i'm and i mostly most of my experience with grief is from death it's i don't have like a lot of i mean i've lost friendships but i think because i experienced death so early 
the other things that I've lost in my life don't compare to that magnitude. So I wouldn't even say it's a pig. Once you experience that, nothing else is ever going to compare. Like that mm-hmm. loss isn't going to compare when you lose like that type of relationship. It's in a your different life. sort of magnitude. Yeah. It's like so a different scale. Losing a job is always going to suck or like losing a friendship will always suck. But the grief that you experience once you experience death is always going to just be bigger. Mm-hmm. And so, I, and I think the difference is that you can, I, I think there's like maybe sm- smaller grief and then there's, there's like small grief and big grief. I think it's the same sort of, to me, comparison of like, you can have a depressive episode or like a causal depression. And yeah. then you can have like depression, depression, like the yeah. capital D depression, right? Where it's like, one is it's more like situational mm-hmm. sort of thing where it's if you are grieving the loss of a job or like you switch from one job to another. Yeah. Um, that's situational in that like eventually you'll move past that. There is sort of like an almost an end point. Yeah. Um, and then or even like loss of a friendship mm-hmm. where you kind of have to cut someone out of your life or they leave your life for whatever reason. And then you can be upset and grieve through that. But the difference is that again, it's situational. There is sort of like an other side of it, but there is always the possibility that it could come back yep. and that you can, you can go back to that job maybe, or you can, it's never, it's not permanently exactly. gone. It's not, it versus, doesn't have to be permanent if one of the parties does not want it to be. Yeah. Versus and the other scenario. Versus death is, it's done. It, it's, it's permanent. You cannot do anything to change it. No, like nothing. And so I think, so that was my my first experience with death and grief was my uncle. And then when I was... And that was as a child, that was as a too. Child. So even like... I was like eight years old. And I think the the thing that really shaped my thoughts and my like view on it was, one, being so young. I And the thing is, because of how my family dynamic was and how everybody functioned then, I saw like my mom and... Uh, cause I, I mean, she was, it was a, she was, that was her baby brother. That was like her best friend. And so seeing how it affected her and then seeing how it affected like even my dad at the time when I saw him, cause I was like somebody he was extremely close with as well. I mean, they, my parents were not together when it happened, but my dad was still very close to my uncle and just seeing how it affected my whole family. And then like, I, because everybody is so inside of themselves with their own grief as a child, it was hard because I had nobody to explain to me how I was feeling mm-hmm. and why I was feeling that and like what was normal, what wasn't normal and um, how to process it, if anything. And so you, the, I think I experienced, because I didn't know how, the only way that I felt close to my uncle after that was keeping that alive. That, because that's all that's left is the the grief, the grief of him being gone. And so I mm-hmm. think, and then as I got older, like I lost my dad in 2020. Um, that was, and that was the first, I mean, I lost my grandmother, my dad's mom when I was 17. And that really, that was horrible, obviously, but there's some, but, but a parent, like that was already kind of a complicated situation and relationship to begin with that. So experiencing like my uncle as a child and then experiencing like my dad as like an adult, it was really weird. Cause it brought up stuff from as a kid, but also like, now that I'm what four years into him being like dead, it you it made me think about how like you get very protective of your grief because it's the only thing that's tying you that or sometimes it feels as if it's the only thing tying you mm-hmm. to the last part of them that's alive. Even though like it's I'm I don't think that that's true, but I think that subconsciously we get so protective of it because the second that like we don't feel the grief as intense or I, I maybe we're thinking that like I I want to keep them here that's the last almost living part because it's mm-hmm. like the last thing that happened yeah and I think you get so protective of it and people have a hard time I haven't experienced that have a hard time understanding that because mm-hmm. it's like well sometimes when I'm by myself and I feel like everything I'm feeling the only thing that understands me is myself and my grief because sometimes like people don't get it and it's not even 
a right or a wrong thing. I think it's hard to understand because it doesn't make sense. Where like you would think I have harder days now than I did when he died, which is like weird. You, because they you would, say time makes things better. And, and I stuff, and but. I think whoever said that's a liar. And I'm going to be straight up honest. If like if you're somebody who listens to this and you've lost somebody and you're struggling really hard and you probably have 100 people in your ear telling you it's going to get easier and it's going to get better. I'm going to be straight up honest with you. It's not. It's never going to get better. And it's never going to get easier. Life just changes mm-hmm. and you adapt to that. And that's OK. But the idea, and I think that's something that always used to piss me off is like, it's going to get better. How? They're dead. (laughs) Like Mm. they're gone. Like it's going to get easier. What's going to get easier? Having a lack of this presence in my life. Like, what do you mean? And Mm. I know what they're trying to say is like, oh, well, you get stronger. And I used to say that it doesn't get easier. You get stronger. And I I agree with that still to a point. But I think the biggest thing is just adaptability. You just get used to it. Yeah, you just get used to it and you're going to have days where you're going to have days where you don't think about it and it doesn't bother you Mm -hmm. for a while. And then all of a sudden you're going to wake up or someone's going to laugh or smile or you're going to see somebody. You're going to be walking down the street and they're going to have like the same presence as them. They're going to there. Someone might have the same mannerism or you're going to smell something. There's the all these things that will happen that are going to trigger you. And it's totally normal for you to suddenly be Mm -hmm. in step one or phase one or two or three all over Mm -hmm. again. And so. The idea that grief is like something you get over to me is just insane. I don't think you ever get over it. You just, it's just, you're, I wonder, I feel like you're in different phases at all mm -hmm. times and the intensity of it is subjective. I think that oftentimes we don't fully understand what acceptance means in terms of grief. Mm -hmm. So I think that some people see it you know, it's the end stage. It's the last hurdle you get through, like you said, to get to the other side. And it's accepting that someone's gone, right? Because the first stage is denial. They're not really gone. This isn't happening. And then the last is acceptance. Okay. They're gone. This has happened. But I don't think that's really to me what acceptance means. No. Acceptance doesn't mean I'm accepting that they're gone and they're never coming back. And now I'm over it. Like, I think acceptance is more of like, is accepting that grief will forever be a part of who you are as a person. Yeah. And that you just accept that some days are going to be better than others. Yeah. And you don't try to fight through the emotion that you're feeling. Yeah. I think that, and and this kind of almost goes for any emotion, I think you have to and some people don't even know what it really means. But when they say, do you give yourself space to feel your emotions? Learning. And and some, again, some people just don't know what, what does that mean? And it's yeah. like, I, you if you're feeling sad, you have to sometimes just kind of like allow yourself to be sad. You, you can't like, because some people initially are like, nope, don't want to be sad. Let me find a way to distract myself. Let me push that feeling down. Let me... Like, just pretend like it didn't happen. Let me forget about it or, Mm -hmm. you know, but you start, you kind of just have to let yourself sit in the sadness. Like I always, uh, I try to equate it to like, um, I'm a a really easy crier when I like read or see something sad. So Mm -hmm. movies, books, stuff like that. And I, or even sometimes songs. And I find that if I try to keep myself from crying, it hurts more. Mm -hmm. Like you feel the burning in your eyes, the lump in your throat. Like there's a physical strain on your body to hold the emotion back. And that to me is not accepting and letting yourself sit with the emotion versus if I just let myself cry, there's no pain. Literally you feel sad. The tears run down your face, but you're not physically hurting. You just gotta just let it out, let it happen. And then it's a, it's, a little easier to maneuver through that. You just let yourself feel it. But I think where some people are, are what some people get scared of is that they're going to let themselves sit in that emotion and then get yeah. stuck in it yeah. and not be able to then move through it, which is a very valid fear. She's talking about me. I mean, a lot of people though. <laughs> no, I know. But and, and this that, is like, yeah, I literally talked yeah. about it. I'm like, I have a difficult time feeling anything like that. Cause I'm so terrified. I'm like, I don't know. I've tripped. I've like things like that. I don't know that I've ever fallen so down, like so far down that I'm like, I feel like I, 
I'm, I'm like limping a lot type of a thing. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, the whole standing back up thing is still something even for me that I'm like, uh, you do all that now. Yeah. How you do that? Yeah. And um, some of it is just like, experience and learning and sometimes it's people helping you through it because you don't you don't know until you're shown how or told how sometimes yeah I think a lot of my problem with that is this is bad this is super personal um when my uncle died I feel like I watched so many people withdraw into themselves and they didn't stand back up ever and I'm like is that normal because like that's the only thing I see as a kid. Like, is mm-hmm. that like they're miserable, like they're miserable. And then they in turn become miserable people. And then they become even this horrible versions of themselves that treat everybody else horrible. And so I'm like, is that what that is? Because if that's what that is, I don't want to do that. So I mm-hmm. just won't ever do that. And I also, as a kid, put a lot of my feelings on the back burner just because I was so conscious of the fact of other people are in pain. Mm hmm. And I don't want to, which is very, I was, I was eight when it happened, but I mean, my life was very different than like the average eight year old. But so when I'm older, I think I just have a hard time even, I mean, I might be sad, but I definitely don't like, I, I'm still learning how to even let myself feel that completely without that initial like let me I gotta fight that off now Mm -hmm. you got to go I gotta fight you off because it's like all the examples in my life of other people that let themselves feel it I don't know that they ever like they're frozen like my Mm -hmm. uncle's been dead 20 20 years and some people are still stuck and they forever will be and I'm like and I know part of that too is because they're so protective of their grief that they don't want to let it go because it's the last part. It's the last thing mm-hmm. they feel they have of him that ties him here, mm-hmm. which isn't true. I think we all forget like love is forever, mm-hmm. you know, that's which is like, remember I, uh, we saw Interstellar and Anne Hathaway talks about like love is the only thing that like transcends time and space and all that. Mm-hmm. And like, it's special. And so I think that often grief and love can get intertwined. And I think sometimes that's what get that's what gets messy too. Is I think sometimes we think that the grief is love mm-hmm. when you loved them before, and you didn't and feel. you didn't feel this mm-hmm. way. So it doesn't. They I think that it gets hard to separate the two. Mm-hmm. And I think when you can, you can accept that love is love and grief is grief, and they might overlap sometimes. But you're allowed to feel love and it not feel like grief Mm -hmm. still for somebody that's gone. But I don't know. I think grief is just interesting because some people, I think a lot of people feel misunderstood when they're going through it. And it's also, it's different for everybody. Like for me, something that I experienced that I felt was, me and you've talked about it before is, um, I thought it was interesting. This is a kind of a weird thing. And I brought this up oddly. It was Robert Irwin. Mm-hmm. His, everybody loves his dad. Mm-hmm. They, you know, Steve, Steve Irwin, Irwin died mm-hmm. from the Stingray thing. And that was a long time ago, but so many people loved his dad, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, Robert experiencing this grief. And at a very young age. At a very too. young age. And, but I'm like, he's, but he sees how the world adored his dad. Mm hmm. And then it, I thought, well, that's kind of beautiful, right? Like, that's interesting. And I wonder if that's helpful because, like, does does that help? Like, when you're grieving somebody in a collective way that's full of love together. Because for me, like, with my uncle, it was very not I, – I, I wouldn't say anybody grieved together. Everybody was very withdrawn within themselves. Mm-hmm. And then my dad, like, the fact is, is, like, I've grieved my dad by myself which has probably been the loneliest feeling like ever, Mm -hmm. which is, it is what it is. And it's not like, no boo hoo me, but it's just like, I wonder, I sometimes wonder like if I think that also changes the course of your grief of, or how intense it could feel or how like even you feel in it. Cause it's one thing to kind of, I would think to grief somebody, I don't have this experience. I wouldn't know collectively in a healthy way together and to know the person that you loved was so loved by other people 
as well. There's like comfort in it, I would think, versus like for me, like it's not the case. Like people feel the people can feel like, oh, that sucks for Jessica. Oh, I feel bad for her. Mm-hmm. But but they don't. They're not grieving my dad. Yeah, they're, they feel bad for me. But like they don't care about my dad. But you're like, the only one experiencing that feeling of loss and that particular grief and that emotion for your father, yeah, like for your dad. It's so, not, it, in, and like you said, anyone who's who loves you and cares about you can feel, you know, a way about how yeah. you feel, but they don't feel what you're actually feeling. Yeah, and I mean, and like, and because I don't live near my family, I wasn't able to experience this. Like with my little brother, we weren't able to be there for each other, and you know, even like my mom's family that knows my dad, like none of it so it's just it's an interesting thing to me with grief because I think sometimes if you feel alone in your grief I think you can get more protective of it than people Mm -hmm. that might experience grief in a healthy way with a great support system of people like where you're all experiencing the same thing together so you there's a camaraderie in it Mm -hmm. and you feel you got someone to lean on because like they know how they actually know how you're feeling because I think there's a difficulty in trying to let people know how you're feeling. And it's like as much empathy as a person can have, they're never going to feel exactly that pain. And I think there's also, that's another reason people just feel closed up where they're like, yeah, you don't get it. Cause also I think your particular type of grief and what you feel is so colored by your relationship with the person. Exactly. So that's and your other feelings thing. for them that even if you are grieving communally with other people, no one is going to grieve, like you said, exactly the way that you do for that person because their relationship with them is so different. Like the closest thing, the closest you would have would be like a sibling mm-hmm. grieving similarly. But even then, your brother's relationship with your dad is so different exactly. to your relationship with exactly. your dad. And so it's just, I think grief is one of those things that I think it's painted as like a, this negative thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I feel that way. I think that grief is... Sometimes it's the only thing you've got left that you can lean on when you're going through it is like Mm -hmm. the relationship and uh, uh, maybe friendship with grief in itself, because sometimes like you're by yourself and you're upset. And even though, you know, you're going through these emotions or you're at whatever stage you're in, Mm -hmm. there's something oddly comforting about this feeling that is the only thing that understands you, even though it's not a... Thing. A, yeah, alive, a li- yeah. but it feels like a presence in your life well, that I, you can lean on, mm-hmm. which is just weird. But I think that's why grief is just so complicated. I think that the best way to kind of explain it is, or a way to explain it, is that when the person, basically when that person dies, there's now a hole mm-hmm. that is in, you know, your soul for lack of a better, yeah. you know, there's a hole within you that now is gone. And then grief is your love for that person filling in that hole, but it's not like a perfect smooth out. It's like you punch a hole in a wall and then you try and like spackle it over. You get the landlord special with that piece of paper. Yeah, really. And they paint over it. Yeah. And so it's kind of, you try and fill that hole and the grief then is the, that like you said it's like that it's like a with the absence of the person the grief takes their presence it's like this imaginary friend or this ghost presence in your life sometimes Mm -hmm. where you're like you almost give it a persona Mm -hmm. and suddenly it's your friend even though it's not your friend and you hate it Yeah. yeah you hate it but sometimes it's the only one that understands you and it's just a weird weird thing and so with taylor's thing it made me think about like how just the whole conversation of the five stages of grief, I think is interesting. I think it tries, and this has nothing to do with Taylor. It's just, she is doing these playlists and it's about the five stages of grief, which is a thing that exists. And it's something that I find interesting, just the grief part in general. So it brought up the conversation, but I think the whole idea of, oh, here's the, even sometimes the five stages, I'm like, Sometimes I agree with, sometimes I don't, because I think it's trying to really sum up this extremely complex system of emotions that just 
you it's hard to do that and so it's like, i think the five stages is like a starting point yeah it's it, trying to simplify something exactly. that is very complex yeah and it's just it's just interesting to me but yeah i mean i feel like if i had to sit here and give any advice to anybody that's experiencing grief for the first time and i'm going off just death i, I don't know and i think because i experienced death so young it's really the only kind of grief that I feel like I've experienced, like I've been, I've had other losses, but not, but this is just kind of takes the front row or front seat to everything else. Is that like, it's okay for it to suck and it's okay for it to, sometimes it feels like it, take, it takes over your life. Sometimes it feels like it alters your personality, alters like your likes and your interests and your dislikes and it alters your friendships and your rela other relationships in your life. And I think that I'm never going to be the person that says like, it'll get better. It's going to, you'll just figure out how to navigate it. And it one day it won't be so heavy in your life all the time. It's never going to not suck to think about. And I think that's another thing that's just, I think there's a pressure. I think that we trying to support people I think we add a pressure to them by saying things like, it's going to get better. Give it time. Give it this. Give it that. I think you are putting pressure on people to feel a type of way that they might not ever feel. And that makes the, their process worse because then they're mad at themselves for, well, why isn't it better? Why do I still feel this way? So by trying to give them support and comfort them, sometimes you're actually just adding pressure to how they should be feeling rather than just how you feel is how you feel. But the one thing I will say, which is just the harsh reality is the world still spins. They're unfortunately gone. You're here. And there does come a point where you have to learn to walk with it. And I think like, the idea that you walk away from grief is wrong. I think you learn to walk hand in hand with it. Mm -hmm. And that's just. It's like you have to be able to be functional with yes. it. Like, the, like this is a bad example, but like functional <laughs> alcoholics, <laughs> functional grief. Like you eventually it doesn't the problem doesn't ever really resolve. It doesn't yeah. go away. You just like we said, figure out how to navigate life. Yeah. Existing with it. So I think that would be, I mean, if I've, I don't even know if I would call that advice, but if I had to just try to tell like explain to somebody the mindset of it, it would be, this will be with you forever, but you learn to function with it and you learn to walk with it. And that's okay. And that's just unfortunately how it goes. But there's odd beauty in it too, which is kind of fucked up. But I mean, I think if you're able to take anything from your life, that's a negative and find the beauty in it. That's also helpful. So, I mean, just learn. I think you have to just relearn yourself. You'll relearn yourself. And so that way, you know how to walk with it. Because the version of you, you're, you're different now. Mm -hmm. You always will be different. You're never going to be the same. And that's okay, though. So, I mean, I think, I don't know. It, it just is an interesting thing. Kind of, I guess it's kind of depressing, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I find it depressing, but also not. But I guess it's also just because I'm like, I don't know. I've dealt with it mm -hmm. for so long that it's unfortunately like a very familiar, I think it's a ghost. It's a little, it's like your imaginary friend. It's just kind of chilling with you all the time. Mm -hmm. So even talking about it, it's almost like talking about your friend, your friend grief. It's kind of a dick, but he's always there. <laughs> He's always around. She, whatever. It. I don't, they. Zezer. Them. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much all my thoughts on that. Okay. Well. So um, next formula race is in China. And don't worry. I know you guys are just like, God, I can't wait to hear what those bitches got to say about it. You will. Um, Yeah. Can't wait. But that's it. That's all. I think that's all we got today. Unless you have anything else. No. I think that was it. I think that's it. Okay, well, that was uh, fun and depressing. So we'll talk at you guys next time. Bye. Bye.